Welcome, future doctors, to another episode of the Future Minority Doctor Podcast with Dr. Sulma and Marina, where we bring you conversations to empower and inspire you to contribute to your community and the world by becoming a doctor. Welcome back, future doctors. Thanks for tuning in again. Today, we are going to hone in on the topic of test-taking skills. That's right, the oh-so-dreaded tests. Specifically, we are going to share some tips and wisdom about how to get better at taking tests. Remember, like we learned a few episodes ago when we discussed growth mindset, tests are just like almost any other ability in life. If you get some proper training and you keep practicing, you can and will get better at taking tests and acing those tests. Dr. Zoma, did you know that the average student has taken 112 standardized tests by the time they graduate from high school? Wow, that's a large number. So imagine if you think about everything that we've done since elementary school, middle school, and high school, we're probably thinking about thousands of tests and that we've probably taken our entire life. Yep, that's a lot of tests. And you know, there's pretty much nobody that escapes taking tests. If you want a driver's license, you have to take a test. If you want to become a plumber or a car mechanic or a scuba diver, you have to take tests. Unfortunately, becoming a doctor involves taking quite a few tests. First, you have to you know, do the SAT or ACT to get into a college. Then you have to do well in all of your college classes and on the MCAT. Then after you get into medical school, you still have to take a whole lot more tests. So it's an essential skill to develop if you are going to succeed at becoming a doctor. Okay, so what you're saying is we have to get pretty good at taking tests. But how exactly do we do that? Well, it's not easy. Acing tests doesn't just require one skill. It's actually a combination of knowledge and skills. So first off, you have to study the material you're being tested on and know it well enough to recall it during a test. For example, if you're being tested on the periodic table of the elements in chemistry, you have to do the work to memorize all the elements and their properties. Then you have to relax enough in order to actually focus on the test instead of letting test anxiety get the better of you. So many people, including me, have struggled on tests because we get nervous and that nervousness impairs our ability to focus and recall what we learned. Luckily, there are some tricks you can learn to help ease your test anxiety. You also have to be able to take tests quickly. Almost every exam has a time limit. If it's a multiple choice exam, you might only have one or two minutes to answer each question, sometimes even less. If it's a writing test, you might have 15 to 30 minutes to write each essay. So you have to be able to finish the test on time. Lastly, it can be really helpful to understand some techniques for each type of test you might have to take. Most standardized tests today are multiple choice tests, and there are definitely a few techniques you can use to get better at those. So to summarize, you have to study, you have to relax, you have to be able to finish on time, and it helps to know some tips and tricks for certain types of tests like multiple choice tests. I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Marina. I think by the time I finished high school, the only test skill I was aware of was the memorizing part and not everything else you said, although I felt it, but I I just wasn't aware of it. So you can imagine how test taking went in my first year of college. Not good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Let's look at each of those components of test taking a little bit more in detail. Dr. Marina, first you mentioned you have to study. So in other words, you have to know your stuff going into the test, right? Yes, absolutely. If you have not taken the time to study and learn the material you're being tested on, then no amount of test taking tips will help you to ace that test. You have to know your stuff. If you haven't already listened to our episode number nine on study habits, please go back and listen to that because we have a lot of tips on how to improve your studying so that you can learn that material that you need in order to do well on a test. So we won't repeat that, but we'll add a few new things. So another important thing is to try to figure out exactly what you need to know for the test. Don't be that annoying student who is always asking the teacher, will this be on the test? Will this be on the test? (laughs) Because nobody likes that. But do try to talk to your teachers or your TAs to understand what you should be focusing on. So this is a big one, and I think that I struggled with. So, Dr. Marina, how do you figure out what's important to study then? Very important question. 
How do you listen to an hour long lecture and figure out what you actually need to study and remember? I have to admit, this was really hard for me in some of my college classes. When I was in high school, I only took one year of basic biology, and honestly, it was not the best class. <laughs> it was a really kind teacher, but I really didn't learn much biology. I remember he would show us a lot of National Geographic videos and would have us like write summaries about them. And we did a few just kind of activities out of the textbook, but it was not an in-depth biology class. So during my first two biology courses in college, I remember sitting through most of those lectures and feeling completely lost in a sea of new words, new concepts, new information. Microtubules and Mendelian genetics and neurosignaling pathways were like a foreign language to me. Because it was all so new, I had a lot of trouble distinguishing between key information and less important information. It was hard to see the big picture. So when I would go home to study, I wasted a lot of time trying to memorize tiny details that weren't that important, and I missed some of the big concepts that were important. Dr. Zulma, did you have any similar experiences? Oh man, the entire time, exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. I remember when I started college and I would try to re review and memorize all the lecture material and read the assigned chapter books of like five different classes mm -hmm. that I was taking in a quarter. I literally thought that the professors were going to test us on everything. And so then that meant that I needed to know it all. Uh -huh. But as we'll discuss more, um, I was obviously approaching it the wrong way. So then what do you do if you find yourself feeling confused and lost? How do you see the big picture and narrow down your focus only on the important details, Dr. Marina? If it's a completely new topic, it might help to do a bit of work before class. If you were assigned some reading, make sure you do it. If you were given the slides or the lecture notes in advance, take some time to look over them. Now, please don't spend hours and hours on this. <laughs> Just <laughs> glance over it. Get an idea of what topics will be covered. It's kind of like making file folders in your mind before a lecture. And then during the lecture, you take all of those details and you store them into the right file folder. If you're learning about human physiology, for example, you have a mental folder for the kidneys and a mental folder for the cardiovascular system and one for the respiratory system and so on. You can even make mental subfolders, like in your cardiovascular system folder, you can have a section for blood vessels and a section for heart anatomy and a section for diseases that affect the heart, etc. Having these mental folders and subfolders is going to help you organize the new information better in your mind so that it's easier to access it when you need it. Now, neurobiology is really complicated and it's not, it doesn't all work exactly like a folder system, but thinking of it in that way can be helpful. And so if you look at your notes ahead of class and you see kind of some of the topics you're going to be covering, at least you know um, mentally how to prepare to then fill in the information in each of those sections. Yeah, so this makes me think of just an example of maybe myself at, at my desk at work. So when it's messy, I can't find anything. But when it's organized, I can find things right when I need them. And if I get new supplies, I know where to organize them. So um, just to give a little example as you're talking, that made me think of that. Mm -hmm, exactly. If you look at your textbook or your lecture slides and there are some words that you don't know at all, take a few minutes to look them up so that you won't be confused by them during a lecture. There's nothing worse than like sitting through a whole lecture and they keep repeating a word and you have no idea what it means <laughs> because then you're just lost throughout the whole thing. I remember that happening a couple of times. <laughs> during lectures also, pay attention to what the teacher focuses on. So put away that laptop. Close that social media, put away that phone, <laughs> pay attention. There will probably be some things that they take their time explaining, and there will be some things that they kind of just go over really quickly. If the professor thinks it's important for you to know, they will probably spend more time on it. If you pay close attention, and again, you're not distracted on your laptop or your cell phone, you will pick up on these clues. So please pay attention during lectures. Also, if your teacher or TA holds review sessions, these are a great way to get an overview of the most important concepts that you will most likely be tested on. So this advice that you just shared, it's so important. 
in college you're assigned these and this is me just recalling from college you're assigned these huge textbooks for your classes are like hundreds of pages long I mean they're like two or three inches uh-huh. and I had to learn that the textbooks were more for reference to look up and read things that the professor stressed in class to get a better understanding but not necessarily to read the entire book I also found that the lecture slides tend to focus on the key issues that the professor finds important. So understanding those topics that are highlighted during lecture is very, very important. So Dr. Marino, what do you think about doing practice questions or practice tests? Do you feel like those help? Absolutely. And I can't really emphasize this enough. Practice questions or practice tests are so, so helpful. Don't waste time just rereading your textbook or rereading your notes. Remember, we talked about active learning in that episode on study habits. You have to practice remembering the information. If you just read it over and over again, you're not actually forcing your brain to recall the information. But remember, when you're taking a test, you're not just going to be reading the information again. You're going to have to recall the information. So if you, for example, used flashcards, or some other technique to force yourself to recall the information, then when you do the test, you'll have that at your disposal. You have to practice remembering the information. How do you do practice questions, say if you're taking something like an English or a history class, which tends to be a little bit different than math and sciences? Yeah, good question. If it's an English or a history class, you can make flashcards for yourself with important vocabulary, concepts, people, dates, or whatever it is you need to remember. You will remember those things so much better on the test if you practiced forcing your brain to remember them over and over again through those practice questions or flashcards. Even if you have to write an essay for a test, you will have more facts and ideas in your memory to draw upon when you have to write that essay. If you don't remember any of the important details, then you won't really have much to write. And then some tests, of course, require you to show your critical thinking skills. That's a more complicated topic, so we won't go into it here. But stay tuned for a discussion about critical thinking skills in a future episode. All right. So compared to the history and English examples you gave, uh, how do you practice questions if you're taking something like math, physics, or OCHEM, organic chemistry? Yeah. If it's a class involving equations and problem solving, then it's actually much easier to find practice questions. Each chapter in your textbook will have practice questions at the end, typically. You can go back and redo your homework problems to make sure you remember how to solve them. You can also try to find old exams to practice with. This is really important. I know especially in college, a lot of the classes, the professors would give us access to like the midterm from last year or the final exam from last year. And it was really important to do those in order to get a sense of what the exam might be like. Now, remember the questions aren't gonna be exactly the same, but at least it gives you an idea of what types of questions might be on the test. And I'd also like to add, not just memorizing, but understanding. So say if you're doing these practice tests and you miss uh, certain questions, understanding why you missed it so you can understand the material better rather than just memorizing what the right answer is. Yes, agreed. Okay, let's say you've studied and prepared as well as you can for your test, and now it's the day of the test. You mentioned a lot of students suffer from test anxiety, and that can definitely affect your performance on the test. How do you combat test anxiety? Let's talk about test anxiety and what to do about it. (laughs) By the way, if you heard our last episode about stereotype threat, you know that it can contribute to anxiety during tests. But the test anxiety we're talking about here is more general. It's those feelings of nervousness, worry, and stress before or during a test. You might even get sweaty palms, a racing heart, and butterflies in your stomach at these times. Luckily, there are some things you can do to train yourself to be more relaxed during and before tests. So first, remember what we've said before. Your grade on a test does not define you. Your grade is simply a measure of your knowledge at a very specific point in time. It doesn't say anything about what you can know next month or next year or in five years. Practice that growth mindset. Remember that even if you don't do as well as you want to on this test, learning is a process and you can get better over time with that effort and training. Also, be nice to yourself. If a niece or a nephew or a child came to you and was really stressed out about a test tomorrow, what would you tell them? 
Dr. Zuma, role play with me a little. What would you tell your son if he came to you worried about a test he's taking at school tomorrow? So uh, I'd like to share in our home, we have a frame that we pretty much reference to every day. The frame says, nobody's perfect. That's why pencils have erasers. I got this frame because I found that my son was at times struggling with being worried that he didn't do things right at school or at home. Having this frame has really given him permission to feel like he doesn't have to be perfect and it's okay. Our discussions usually involve telling him that all you can do is your best and it is okay if it's not perfect. Whatever we don't know today, we can learn later. And interestingly enough, my son had a math test last week. I was working from home and he came in and before taking the test and he let me know that he was going to try his best and knew that it would be okay if he made mistakes because he doesn't have to be perfect. Now, my son right now, he's in second grade, but I hope that he carries this mindset well into high school and college. So giving you this example for all of you that are listening, it's really important to start having those thoughts that that one test does not define who you could be in the future. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, if your son came to you, you would be kind and encouraging, right? Well, just like you would be nice and kind and encouraging to someone you care about, practice being nice to yourself. Don't beat yourself up over the possibility of a B or C or any grade. Just encourage yourself to do the best you can and remind yourself that it'll probably all be okay in the end. We all have that kind of voice in our head (laughs) that's like constantly (laughs) analyzing and talking to us and worrying and um, imagining the future. But, you know, that voice in your head, what it's saying to you really matters. So train that voice in your head to say positive things instead of negative things as much as possible. Yeah. And, you know, just as we're talking about this, it's so easy for us to really grasp on to getting a B or a C or not doing well on the test. And we completely forget all the A's that we've uh-huh. done in the past. That's true. <laughs> like those meant nothing. And we just hold on to that one test we didn't do good and forget about all those tests that you've done great on. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Our brain definitely has what's called a negativity bias. So it's much easier for our brain to kind of hold on to the negative stuff or think negative things instead of positive things. So it does require some training. It requires practice to really retrain um, your brain to say those nice things to yourself instead of the mean things. Also, I want to mention a lot of anxiety, just anxiety in general, originates from an overly active imagination. What I mean is that we allow our mind to imagine all sorts of bad and terrible and scary things that could happen, but most of them never actually happen. One antidote to this is to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is basically training your brain to focus on the present moment instead of letting it take you on detours into the past or the future. Instead of thinking about what might happen if you don't get an A on the test, choose to focus on things that are actually happening right now. So look at the buildings, look at the trees, (laughs) look at the birds, look at your hands, look at anything, you know, pay attention to what's actually happening in the moment. Take time to appreciate the things around you as you drive or walk to your test. Take deep breaths and try to focus on the flow of air into and out of your body. Pay attention to your body and what it's feeling. Are your palms sweaty? Is your heart beating faster? Observe the reactions of your body with curiosity, as if you were observing the shapes of clouds in the sky. Don't judge your body's reaction or let yourself get even more nervous about what's happening. Just sit back and observe. Say to yourself something like this. My palms are sweaty. My heart is racing. These things are happening because my mind is being a crazy monkey and thinking about all the bad things that could happen. But I'm going to take a moment to pay attention to what is actually happening right now. The sun is shining. There's a light breeze that I can feel blowing. I'm wearing my favorite jeans, which make me feel good. I can feel the breath going into and out of my lungs. At the moment, I am safe and I am not being chased by a tiger or struck by lightning, so I can choose to feel calm. The things that you choose to focus on and say to yourself in that moment of mindfulness are going to be different based on your situation. But the point is to focus on the moment so that your monkey mind doesn't drag you into the past or into the imagined future. Dr. Zulma, I'm curious, do you ever do things like this? Yeah, so I had to learn what the practice of mindfulness was. And to be quite honest, I probably didn't get introduced to it till probably in the last one to two years. Mm-hmm. 
I feel that um, it does help. I've actually practiced it before going to bed because along with anxiety, especially when you take tests the night before, it's so hard to go to sleep at night because you're, you're, you're anxious about that test you're going to take tomorrow. So now, not necessarily that I'm taking a test, but there's always things for work or if there was a complicated patient or labs that are pending for a patient that I'm concerned about. So I've started practicing where I do mindfulness before I go to bed. And I found that I get a lot more restful sleep and I'm able to focus better the next day. So this is new to me. So I'm learning it still within the last one to two years. So for those of you who are listening who are in high school and college, you'll be in such a better place than I am today <laughs> if uh-huh. you start practicing yeah. it. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's pretty new to me too. I've really just started delving more into it the last couple of years. And I think that's because just as a society, we're becoming more aware of it as a possibility, as a technique for helping us with a lot of the problems like anxiety that a lot of people suffer with. So another thing is if you suffer from severe anxiety that affects not only taking tests, but other areas of your life, um, like relationships or sleep or appetite, anything like that, please, please go talk to a therapist or your primary care doctor or a psychiatrist. We will have a future episode on dealing with depression and anxiety, so stay tuned. But if you already recognize that this is a struggle for you, please don't delay. Start on the path of getting professional help. It takes a lot of time to learn how to manage anxiety. So the sooner you start, the sooner you will find relief. And then if you have really severe test anxiety, the type that makes you get a racing heart or sweaty palms or headaches or stomach aches, but it's really just around test taking, consider talking to your doctor about medications you might be able to take. There are some medications that can help with these reactions, but the decision about whether these are right for you is between you and your doctor. All right, so let's say you've studied the material well and you've conquered your test anxiety. Next, you said you have to be able to take tests quickly, so you finish on time. So how do you do that? Yeah, a lot of people struggle with finishing tests on time, especially standardized tests like the SAT, ACT, or MCAT. If you struggle with this, know that you are not alone. It's a common problem. In fact, it took me a long time to be able to finish tests on time. I was always one of the last students to finish, and there definitely have been times when I left the last few questions blank because I ran out of time. Has this ever been an issue for you, Dr. Zulma? Yes. (laughs) I was often one of the, I would say, last one or two students taking tests. So if you listen to the podcast where I talked about my journey, reading comprehension was not one of my strengths. It took me a bit longer to read than the average student. There were definitely tests where I had to skip questions or just leave them unanswered as well. All right. So here are some general tips if you struggle to finish tests on time. Tip number one, for some tests like the science and reading sections of the ACT or most sections of the MCAT, the question itself can be really long or what's called the question stem can be really long. These might be a few paragraphs that you have to read just to get to the actual question. If that's the case, it's helpful to skip down to the actual question, which is usually at the very end of the long question stem. Once you know what the actual question is, you can go back and read the question stem quickly in order to find the key information you need to answer the question. Some college tests may also be like this, and it's often helpful to know the question first so you don't waste time trying to understand or remember everything in, that, in the question stem. I remember finding those frustrating, especially on the MCAT, <laughs> that it was like oh, you had yeah. to read a few paragraphs, and then it was like, okay, like how can I remember everything in these paragraphs? What do I actually need to know? <laughs> and uh, so skipping to that question first can be really helpful. I wish I would have known that. You know that, Marina? (laughs) Uh, I mean, when I'm looking at this, I think maybe that could have helped me because I did have to skip some questions or just guess. But and given, like I said, with the reading comprehension that I had always struggled with, 
I mean, I, I wish I knew that I should just read the question first and then go back and read everything. Mm-hmm. So I know what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, this is, like I said, this is a common struggle. Uh, my husband tutors sometimes students in the ACT, SAT subject tests and MCAT even. And so he, he says that even these like, you know, wealthy white students, they he tends to tutor, like they struggle. So it doesn't matter like <laughs> who you are, you can struggle with finishing tests on time. And that is one of the tips he really emphasizes is read the question first, then go back (laughs) and Mm -hmm. figure out what's important to actually read. All right. Tip number two, do the easiest questions first, then go back and do the harder ones. This applies to almost any subject or type of test, not just multiple choice tests. If you have math problems or short essay questions, you can still do this. First, answer the questions you know how to answer. Then go back and finish the others. That way you get maximum credit for the things that you do know instead of just getting stuck on a harder question and running out of time because you spent so much time trying to figure out that one question. Just make sure that if especially if it's a long test, you mark the questions that you need to go back to, like put a circle or put a star next to them so that you know that you need to go back to them and you don't accidentally forget if you have time. Tip number three, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but practice, practice, practice. The more you practice taking tests under timed conditions, the better you will get at finishing on time. This is really important for standardized tests like the SAT or MCAT, where your score is very important for your chances of getting into college or medical school. The MCAT in particular, it's a long test. It's about eight hours long. So if you don't practice focusing and taking a test for that long, it's going to be harder for you on test day. Even for the tests that are not eight hours long, if you are on the slower side or like Dr. Zulma mentioned, you struggle with reading comprehension, then practicing answering a lot of questions in a short amount of time is going to help you get faster. If you are taking a written test, it's also important that you practice pacing yourself so you know that you can finish on time. So for example, if it's a short essay that you have to write, Practice doing a few short essays so that you know that you can write quickly enough and think quickly enough during the actual test. Also, as we mentioned before, the more you use flashcards or other recall practices during your study time, the faster you will be able to recall what you need during a test. Any input on that, Dr. Zulma? No, I think the the practice scene is just very key. It's, it's a skill. It's like anything else. Riding a bike, you just got to keep practicing, practicing, and then you get better. Any sports. I mean, I think the idea of even just doing the test taking, it's just a lot of practicing before the actual exam, not after. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> so, then, so then that way, when you come to it, you know, yeah, you're not going to get 100%. That's fine. Or even whatever it might be. But you'll probably improve your score compared to if you have not practiced. Mm hmm. So tip number four, be careful not to hurry so much that you make silly mistakes. A lot of multiple choice tests have questions that say something like, which of the following is not a fat soluble vitamin or whatever it is, or all of the following are true except. So make sure that you're reading it carefully, because if you read it too quickly, you might just think you might miss that part that says not or except, and you might circle the wrong answer. So make sure you slow down enough to pay attention to the question so you don't make those rushed mistakes. I know that I've definitely made those mistakes. And then when I get my test back and I look over it, I'm like, oh, I knew that, (laughs) but I got it wrong. And it's so frustrating to lose those points when you know that you actually did know the material. Yeah, that happened to me as well. I What I ended up learning through time was that, um, and somebody told me this, they said, underline the not or the accept part while you're reading the question. So it's almost like a cue to you to remember what you're trying to answer. Uh-huh. So if, if that helps anybody out there, it, it really helped me to just underline that part. Yeah. And it usually is in like uppercase letters. But even then, if you're trying to go fast through a test, it's easy to miss it. So underlining that to remind yourself is a great idea. A lot of the tests that you have to take in high school, college, and medical school are multiple choice tests. So what are some techniques students can use on these tests to make sure they're scoring as high as possible, Dr. Marina? Yes, there are too many multiple choice tests, in my opinion. Unfortunately, these tests, they don't really reflect the type of work you will actually have to do in your future job, whether you become a doctor or an electrician. 
But the fact is that you have to get good at taking these tests to do well in college and medical school. So here are just a few general tips for multiple choice tests. Like we just mentioned, remember, do the easy questions first, then go back and do the hard ones. Skip ahead to the question when there's a really long question stem. And then pay close attention to the questions so you don't make silly mistakes. Another tip is this. For the questions you don't know the answer to right away, it can be really helpful to narrow down the options. You go through the answer possibilities and you cross out any answers that you are pretty sure are wrong. And sometimes you know at least that one of them is wrong. Or sometimes two of the answers will be very similar or just different terms for the same thing. So you can actually cross those out because you know they're basically the same thing and you can't have two right answers usually. If you can narrow it down to two options, you then have a 50% chance of getting the question right, even if you just have to guess between those two. The only case in which you wouldn't want to guess on these is if it's a test where you get penalized or docked points for guessing, like the ACT. And there are some other exams that do that too. Some professors in college will do that, but most won't. Another tip is this. Once you've read the question, try to answer the question in your mind before looking at the answer options. This will help you avoid getting confused by the answer options, and it can help you be more confident in your answer if it's something that you do know. And then the last tip, remember that some questions have multiple right answers, and for some questions, the right answer will be all of the above. Sometimes it's tempting to circle an answer that you automatically recognize as correct, but pay attention to whether all of the above is an answer option. If it is, make sure to review all of the answer options to make sure you're selecting the right one. Because if you automatically jump to circling that one that you know is right, and then you don't realize that the other options are also right, then you'll miss circling all of the above. Of course, once in a while, um, you're going to goof up and get something wrong, even though you knew the right answer. It happens to everyone. Don't worry. Remember, with time and practice, you'll make less mistakes. Right, Dr. Zuma? Agreed. Just remember, you will never know everything. Trying your best is good enough. If you don't do so well on an exam, understand your mistakes and don't just memorize the right answer and practice the test-taking skills that we spoke about today. Acknowledge that there is room for growth and that one test does not define who you are. Exactly. We're going to repeat that a lot. (laughs) Those tests do not define you. We hope you start to believe it after a while. Um, Anyway, we hope you found at least some of this advice helpful. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Give us feedback, what you like, what you don't, what topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, what questions you have about becoming a doctor, pre-med classes, or applying to medical school. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and through our website at www.futureminoritydoctor.com. We hope if you like this podcast that you also share with your family or friends to help us recruit more minorities to becoming doctors. Thanks for listening, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Peace and love, everyone.